respond to my talk. My talk is going to be lighthearted. I, I want people to jump in. You can ask a question. I may ask you questions, whatever. We'll just kind of have some, some fun with this. So the, I'm going to do ECMO patient selection and then ECMO complications part one. And then we'll take a break and then John will come back and do his anticoagulation and then I'll do part two, okay? So I wanna you know, start this off with some key points. And that is ECMO is a powerful tool, but there must be a destination. You gotta have that. Indications and contraindications are by and large relative. Now there are some absolutes and we'll talk about those as I move forward, but by and large, they're judgment decisions. Um, and if you're gonna do ECMO, call early. Mm -hmm. Calling early saves lives. Calling late portends usually a, 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 a poorer outcome uh, and sometimes just a, 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 a position of futility, if you will. So let me just move to this part here, uh, some historical perspective, and I don't wanna spend much time on it, but you know, between the 30s and 54, of course, Dr. Gibbon and his development of the heart-lung machine, and there were others involved, of course, um, many others who were working on the same project, uh, but he gets the credit for it, and I think, uh, I think uh, deservedly so. Uh, in the 50s, of course, Dr. DeWall, who was working on a membrane oxygenator, and I don't know if you all knew this or not, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but Dr. DeWall was one of the, was one of the first, or the DeWall, bubble oxygenators ever made. And it was a very interesting, very interesting device. But as a side note, it was Dr. DeWall who figured out that to deal with the foaming blood, you use this surfactant material, mm -hmm. Dow Corning, it was made by Dow Corning at the time, anti-foam anti A. a. Yep. Exactly. Well, I actually, believe it or not, have a copy of a letter that, uh, that uh, Dr. Um, oh my gosh, uh, his boss, Dr. Oh, I can't, I'm blanking on his name now. Um, I'll think of it later, uh, sent to the president of, of, of uh, Dow Corning and said, look, we're using this with success. Mm -hmm. We've tested it in animals with amounts much larger than we would need in humans, but we cannot seem to find any toxicity. Is there anything you can share with us about it? Now this is silicon based, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, they ended up using it for quite a long time. But actually DeWall came up with this idea on his own. He thought of it independently as the solution to managing the foaming caused by the bubbling. Mm -hmm. And then later, of course, this is up at Mayo, um, later, of course, Dr. Cooley, who went up there to see some of these operations, came back and made his famous coffee pot bubble oxygenator from the coffee pot percolator he got from the, uh, from the uh, what do you call that, the restaurant supply store. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, one of the, that was the second bubble oxygenator. So very interesting story with Dr. Wolf. He was working on a membrane oxygenator for the purpose of longer term support, even back then, yeah. which is really amazing. Um, in 71, it was the first reportable successful use of ECMO and uh, it was published in the New England Journal. It had to do with an adult patient with post-traumatic respiratory failure. They basically went into ARDS. Uh, 1972 was the first successful pediatric use. In 75, between 75 and 89, the, the randomized controlled trial that was done by Zapal, or Zappel, however you pronounce that name, um, sort of was the prevailing belief, and it was a negative trial. So in that trial, they concluded that there was real, really no benefit, survival benefit with ECMO for mm -hmm. either circulatory support or pulmonary support. So mm -hmm. it was a negative trial. And that was published in JAMA uh, in 1979. Uh, in 1975, uh, Dr. Bartlett, of course, had the case Esperanza 
And the story of en es en uh, Esperanza, if you will, I'm gonna go ahead and let you read it. I'll just go ahead and flip this, but you can read it. But she had infantile respiratory distress syndrome. Her mother immigrated here across the border, uh, uh, you know, from by walking. Um, she was pregnant, had the baby, uh, aspirated a lot of meconium, went into IRDS, and he treated that patient successfully, and thus the name, uh, the nurses named the baby Esperanza, meaning hope in Spanish, of course. And at that point in time, Dr. Bartlett, who was a thoracic surgeon, uh, embarked on what is now the, the body of knowledge for ECMO, and of course, mm -hmm. he's the founder of ELSO. So I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. In the 1990s, and I'll go back to that slide, or you can look at it later and freeze the screen. Uh, we started seeing neonatal and pediatric ECLS centers. ECMO really was thought still at that time to be appropriate for the younger mm -hmm. uh, population, not so much for the older. In fact, you know, even as late as the, the, the mid 90s, our results with ECMO were still pretty poor. Ooh, and uh, a lot of that, I believe, was because of uh, timing and also selection, so mm. both. And there was a level of disgust with everybody we use this on dies. Mm -hmm. And so you start losing confidence in the tool because right. it wasn't really being used with the right patients, nor was it being used soon enough. And I think that was a, I believe that was a big part of the problem. Uh, in 2000, however, that started to change and you started seeing adult ACLS center or ECLS centers uh, begin. And then in 2009 was the CESAR trial, which many people I know dispute the findings of the CESAR trial. They criticize the study design. I get all of that. But it was, a, I think, a pretty clear, in my view, I think it was a good trial and I think it showed uh, a clear survival benefit with VV ECMO, particularly in ARDS. And so uh, from then on, we have seen an explosion mm -hmm. of ECMO centers, an explosion of ECMO use. And we have seen concurrent with that, an incredible amount of patients who have survived right. that would not have survived. Right. Their vent settings and their gases and their oxygenation was essentially looking at that patient. This is going to be a, this is a hundred percent mortal situation. This patient is not going to survive. Um, mm -hmm. And then use ECMO. And I've seen people who, uh, who were in that position walk out of the hospital. Right. In fact, we just saw one. Yes, we uh, did. Very recently, yes, who was did. a police officer who's going to come to the studio, by the way. Is he really? He is, and he's going to talk about uh, his, uh, his case. He has agreed to come here and sit down and talk about how all of what happened to him happened with the COVID. So it was the first, he is the first COVID patient treated with ECMO in the entire Houston greater Houston area, including mm -hmm. the medical center. Right. So big circle around the around Houston, actually in the south in, in the state of Texas from compared to anywhere. So he was the first to be treated with ECMO. And he's going to come here and, and tell us a story. He walked out of the hospital is perfectly fine and feels much better and is grateful for all of the life saving measures that we all took. But he was sick. He was very and sick. he was not going to survive. No. So here again is the story of Esperanza. I didn't mean to just glaze over it early because it is a great story, but you know, I'll, I'll leave it to you to read. You can freeze the screen later and come back to it and read it, but it's a very nice story. It's meaningful. And it's why one of the reasons why we all do what we do. Things like this. You go back, do you remember Dr. Bailey? Len Bailey, Dr. Uh, Baby Faye, mm -hmm. you know, he passed. Oh, he did? He did, he passed. Oh. His wife passed and then he passed a week later, or two weeks later. Um, it was very sad. I mean, we lost somebody who was, I mean, both him and his wife were, were beautiful people. Mm -hmm. um, but Dr. Robachek passed too. I mean, 
I mean, we've lost 75% of our Crystal Heart Award recipients, <laughs> you know, from the conference. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, amazing. Yeah, amazing. Dr. Robachek said he, he was the best, he was one of the best, best uh, uh, Crystal Heart recipient speeches I've ever heard. He got up there, and of course he's Hungarian, he fought the Germans and the resistance. He was, this dude was, this dude was, was I could say it, I think I think I could use this word, he was badass. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, and he was gruff. And you talk like this, Joe, what are you doing, Joe? <laughs> yeah, why don't you know that, Joe? And he gets up to accept the award. He, you know, the ceremony happens and he's gonna give his speech and he says, well, I've come to realize you become very awardable when you get old. <laughs> and it's like, what, he doesn't have to say anything else. It was over. <laughs> so he was an incredible human being, but he recently passed and uh, I feel horrible about that. You know, Dr. Body had trained under him. I think I remember part of, yeah. He I, did. Yeah. He did. I remember that. He did. Yeah. He was something else. He was something else. In fact, in the, uh, in the, uh, when the AIDS epidemic started, um, Dr. Robachek, how I learned about Dr. Robachek was from back then. It was like 1987 or 88. And I read an article that he wrote. And it was basically how healthcare professionals that are in surgery, he's a heart surgeon, of course, too, but how you should manage a potential like needle stick or puncture of an infected needle or an uncertain whether it's an infected needle. Mm -hmm. And he said, you take a 10 cc syringe filled with betadine. And if you get stuck, for example, in your finger, he's calculated out, I'd have to go back and look at it, but there is a point of time, there's from the point you get the inoculation that whatever you are inoculated with virally is going to stay local for a period of time. Now, it's not a lot of time, but it's enough time. Mm -hmm. And if you take the syringe with the lidocaine and you inject it into the site and infiltrate it, you will not end up getting an HIV infection. It'll kill the virus before it has had a chance to get into your system, get away from the local area and get into your system and proliferate. Mm. And so at first I was like, that sounds painful. But then you think, okay, well, it's that or dead. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. So for years, I kept a 10 cc syringe of betadine mm -hmm. on my pump with an 18 gauge needle. I did. I figured I would do it if I had to. You know, because we did cases that were HIV, oh, HIV positive. Probably more than we, we knew. Probably that too. Absolutely. Okay. so. General overview, um, ECMO is a technique that involves obviously oxygen and blood outside of the body and provides pulmonary, circulatory, or both full cardiopulmonary support in patients with severe cardiac and or respiratory failure. There's two major modalities, veno-arterial and veno-venous, identified frequently as VA or VV. And as John Ingram uh, taught us the other day, where the dash is, is where the oxygenator is. So when you get into these real fancy um, systems and you need to describe it, right. you just have to remember, John, I think I got this right, the dash goes where the oxygenator is. Is that right, John? That's exactly right. And Good. On the, See, on I the think... left side is all your blood coming in and on the right side is, uh, is all your blood going back. So it's yeah. access oxygenator return. The dash is the oxygenator. So see, I do pay attention. ECMO mm -hmm. has to have a destination. We mentioned this. And those destinations are either a bridge to transplant surgery, a bridge to recovery, mm -hmm. or a bridge to decision. Because sometimes those happen. If the patient gets put on uh, uh, ECMO, VA ECMO, they need a heart transplant or they put, it, put on VV ECMO, they need a lung transplant, um, or they're gonna get a permanent VAD or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some, some surgical procedure we need to just bridge them to, to get mm -hmm. them there. Then there's, of course, we're just gonna keep them on this until they recover, if they do. 
And then of course there's those that we put it in. We're uncertain about a variety of things. It might be an unwitnessed arrest, but they put them on ECMO anyway, which you probably shouldn't, but they're young and you have to make these judgment calls. Mm -hmm. And when they're very young, a 19 year old who, uh, and remember the case we had? Um, at the, I don't want to say the name of the hospital, but the, uh, at, at that hospital where I kind of first started, mm -hmm. and it was that 19-year-old who uh, they found her in her college, uh, her college class, and she had collapsed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but but no one noticed it. Nobody really could say how long it had been. Um, and we put her on VA ECMO, and uh, she ended up she didn't survive, uh, and she was she she was uh, neurologically uh, 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 gone but uh, had an oxic brain injury, but, um, or an oxic brain death. But, you know, who's gonna say no? Mm -hmm. She got on, mm -hmm. she got put on. And I can understand that. But once, the, once it was recognized, then you make that decision. And that's what bridge the decision is. Right. You know, really what it means. Um, let's see, did I skip, skip one or did I just mess up? Oh, there you go. Okay, so I messed my slides up. Again, can you guys pay attention to my slides? I mess them up all the time. Okay, so patient selection, indications for use, okay? Uh, acute reversible cardiac or pulmonary failure when the risk of dying from the condition is greater than the potential risks of ECMO because ECMO is not without risks. It is a rather invasive thing to do to people. Mm -hmm. It's not like dialysis. It's not like just a big IV. For all of you folks out there watching that may not be ECMO experts for some reason, those that are understand where I'm coming from here. Mm -hmm. This is not a simple, easy, uncomplicated, low risk procedure. We've made it that way, like mm -hmm. heart surgery. Heart surgery used to have a 70% mortality rate. Mm -hmm. Now for a routine cabbage, it's under 1%. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, it's less than 1%, but maybe not, maybe as high as 3%, depending on your other risks, mm -hmm. your, other, your other comorbidities. But it's very, very low. ECMO is very similar, but it's not without risk. And that's something that you have to be very careful of. Um, it's used in neonates, pediatrics, and adults. I don't do neonates, I don't do pediatrics. My focus is going to be on adults. I'd love to find some neonatal and uh, pediatric perfusionists who could actually address this. It's not my field of expertise, but I've always wanted to do more with those guys, but it's very hard to get them to, uh, to come. Um, each center develops institutional guidelines for ECMO use, including indications and contraindications. So each center that is going to each hospital that provides ECMO as a therapeutic modality can sit down, look at the ELSO recommended guidelines, mm -hmm. but they can make their own. And there are a variety of standards that you have to take into consideration. There's international standards, there's national standards, but there's also local standards. And you have to, you know, work with the with what you have. You don't have to directly follow ELSO standards. You can vary from them so long as it comports with a community standard of where you are. So you can't be way out and over here, way out over there. There's a standard of care if you're going to provide this as a therapeutic modality. Your inclusion exclusion criteria have to be both reasonable to other people of mm -hmm. like education, uh, but also they have to be clear. Right. And, uh, and that's very important. Did I not, did I skip a slide again? Did I, I not do that? Okay, there. All right, so there's that slide, okay. I keep, for, do me a favor, if I don't switch the slide, to yell at me. Okay, so VA ECMO patient selection. You have the indications, you have the contraindication. I'm talking about VA now. There are relative contraindications mm -hmm. and there are absolute contraindications. And I'm gonna go through all of this, you know, as we, uh, as we move forward here with this. So first let's look at the potential indications. Failure to wean or post-cardiotomy syndrome, 
drug overdose with profound cardiac depression, myocarditis, early graft failure, so patients post-op in the ICU, uh, acute heart failure for a variety of reasons, and now you're gonna put them on bridge to decision, especially if it's idiopathic, you don't know what's wrong with them, they're just in heart failure, and then you realize you can or cannot do something for them, and then decisions get made. Pulmonary embolism, cardiac or major vessel trauma, pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary trauma, acute anaphylaxis, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, something that can last, you know, from the, from the, uh, mm-hmm. from the uh, uh, last month of pregnancy all the way to three months after pregnancy. We did one of those. And yes, absolutely. We just recently did, absolutely. And of course, sepsis. Um, relative contraindications and these are the same for both VV or VA, but I highlighted, I didn't highlight the, the ventilation, I highlighted the others. Prolonged CPR greater than 45 minutes. That is a relative contraindication because you could have somebody with some kind of refractory VTAC that is young, viable mm-hmm. it's an electro it's a it's an electrophysiologic problem right, right. and so you're not going to deny that person ECMO because you've been doing CPR for 46 minutes mm-hmm. so these are judgment decisions okay but it's a guide major pharmacologic immunosuppression is an enormous problem and for VA ECMO that is a big problem you know if they have their if their white count is 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 mm-hmm. uh under 400 or less than 400, I mean, you you know, it's not gonna work. Um, You have to consider what you're looking at. Right. You know, if the patient's condition is is really futile, you should not put that patient on ECMO. You really should. Um, But that flip side of that is, when you don't know and they're young, or they are still, you know, otherwise a healthy person who's lived, uh, uh, that is living a very full life, got to do everything you can right. it's the decision part that's hard and that's ethical and we're not going to get into that today but it's another conversation we've had it before with dr samir coagulopathies uh that's a relative mm. contraindication because they're going to bleed and they're going to have a lot of bleeds irreversible multi-organ uh system failure that's chronic advanced age greater than 70. That's iffy too. I know a lot of 70 year olds that can whip a 40 year old's butt sometimes. So again, I think you have to look at not the age, you have to look at the total uh, condition of the, uh, of the patient. So absolute contraindications, this is, you don't put it in. They have a non-recoverable heart function and not a candidate for any other therapy. When they do not, when they are in complete heart failure and they have no other option and they are not recoverable, so bridge to recovery is no longer an option, it is a direct contraindication. If they're non-recoverable respiratory disease and not candidate for transplant, So if their respiratory disease or their heart disease is an irreversible problem and not a candidate for some surgical intervention or mechanical, long-term mechanical device, they're not a candidate. And then Ebola, and it seems odd Ebola sitting in there, but there is a reason Ebola is there. This is Elso's Ebola statement. And basically what it says is that the Ebola infection can cause hemorrhagic problems and a lot of multi-organ dysfunction problems. Mm -hmm. But along with that, it is so easily spread with bodily fluids that here you have a hemorrhagic condition that you are putting surgical, surgically, whether it's percutaneously mm-hmm. or not, it's still surgically. You're putting tubes in, running it at high speeds through a device. So you have two issues. The hemorrhagic nature, which is probably gonna result when you now anticoagulate them, right. is they're gonna bleed, gonna bleed to death. Uh, to death. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course you are putting the healthcare providers at tremendous risk. And so it is a, an ELSO position statement that patients with Ebola should not be treated with ECMO. 
I thought that was interesting. It is. Advantages of VA ECMO are that you rest both the heart and the lungs. The patient is protected from cardiac arrest. If you have a patient on VA ECMO and they go into VTAC or VFib, other than wanting to make sure that the ventricle does not distend and blow up, which is why you may do some compressions, mm -hmm. You don't have to run in there and hit the code button and drag in the code cart and go crazy. Right. They are supported fully. In fact, it may be it may even help Probably some patients yeah. if right if they have dual circulation, right? right? So anyway, so you're protected from cardiac arrest. You have the potential for full support, and I say potential for obvious reasons uh, of 100 percent, depending on the flow. If you have good venous return you're going to have good flow. Now, I will tell you, on the VA ECMOs that I have done historically, um, where I was unable to capture all of their, 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 their circulation, you know, I will tell everyone, there's two ways to skin the cat, right? You can add, sometimes, a second outflow, mm -hmm. uh, but really the best thing to do is to add another access. It's almost, I would say, ineffective with the, if you don't want the heart to eject and you're on VA ECMO, adding another return line is not the right, it, it may even, it may seem for some people intuitive because I've seen people do it, but it makes no sense whatsoever. You want another access. Now, John, you do a lot more ECMO than I do. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? You're talking about FEM, FEM, VA ECMO? Yes. Well, there is two approaches you could take. One is to move that femoral arterial cannula up to a right subclavian, I'm mean, sorry, right axillary arterial perfusion, and now you've eliminated the problems to a large extent, provided you could flow enough. Well, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about north-south syndrome. I'm just talking oh. about having enough flow. Well, having enough flow is almost always about adding a cannula. Right. But or access, not a return cannula, an access cannula. Well, well, sometimes you have too small of a return cannula. Somebody, mm -hmm. we, we have patients shipped in with a with a 15 French uh, femoral venous, a femoral artery cannula on a very big guy, and we cannot flow. We, you know, our pressures mm -hmm. are 350, 400. So, but rarely, but but most of the time, yes, you're usually wor worried about uh, increasing your venous drainage out of the patient so you can flow more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you had the unique, I think, experience. I think we did too, Rodell. You may have to, or you may know, um, both of you guys. We, you, you, had, you had two ECMO, entire ECMO systems, right? Two ECMO pumps. Yes. With two complete ECMO circuits. I know Mike did that. Rodell, right. you did it. John, you did it too, didn't you? Yeah, we, we've done it twice, and it involves four different v venous cannulas yeah and uh, you can do a fem fem venous and then you can do a um right ij uh, usually it's three cannulas but technically one mm -hmm. of them is a dual cannula yeah. mm -hmm. when you do like an avalon or crescent in the do. right mm -hmm. ij and you have two femoral venous cannulas mm -hmm. and one ecmo may not one ecmo unit may not be able to flow enough Mm -hmm. to oxygenate all that, mm -hmm. so you have to split it into two. That's what's happened a couple times. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. And VA ECMO is also easier for volume management than VV. So we're comparing VA to VV. So the advantages are you have easier volume management because you can turn your flow up. You need to empty the right side, you turn your flow up. Um, but I don't think that that's, you know, I think you can be, still become fluid overloaded certainly very easily either way and frequently are, right? It's pretty rare that we end up um, uh, 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 fl desiccated, fluid, fluid depleted when we do ECMOs. Most mm -hmm. ECMOs we do, they end up fluid overloaded and we have to manage that Right. Uh, very hard. So disadvantages of VA ECMO, potentially less pulsatile, right. requires arterial cannulation, 
So it's a second cannula from if you use a single cannula technique for VV, but you're also, you're going into the arterial system. That is a very different thing mm -hmm. than being in the venous system. Yep. Now you're raising the stakes. You're making this a little bit more risky. Yep. Uh, more problems can occur. You can have more bleeding because mm -hmm. this is the arterial system. You can have distal perfusion issues, which we'll talk about. You can have retrograde uh, dissection. You can, there's a lot of things that can happen when you're in, you can have, and I've seen it, perforation where you go retroperitoneal with the cannula and you go on pump and the pump run is really short because all the blood is now in the retroperitoneum. So we've seen all of these things. As I said from the very beginning of this, I don't ever wanna, I don't ever wanna come across with being cavalier about the use of ECMO. It's a serious, very risky, though we've made it very safe, life-saving when used properly tool, mm -hmm. but it's not something people willy-nilly should be doing. You gotta be trained. You gotta know what you're doing. Whether you're the cannulator or you're the ECMO operator, whatever it may be, or managing the patient, the intensivist, you gotta know what you're doing. Um, another disadvantage is coronary blood flow. And that is mostly when you have um, uh, 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 dual circulation. So your coronary blood flow is not necessarily interrupted, it's just hypoxic. Right. You basically get coronary ischemia secondary to uh, Harlequin syndrome, uh, uh, dual circulation, north-south syndrome, uh, whatever you want to call it. VV ECMO physiology is the Basically, you're taking the blood from the right atrium, you're oxygenating it, and you're putting it back into the right atrium in some, you know, form or fashion, cava, inferior, superior, vita cava, whatever. Um, a volume of blood that's removed is equal to return, so there is no net effect on hemodynamics because it is a closed loop system. You're taking venous blood from the superior, inferior vena cava, putting it right back into the right atrium, one cc for one cc. So there's, as far as what the patient's volume status is, it doesn't change that at all. And you're also not providing any arterial systemic flow. So therefore you have no hemodynamic changes. The only hemodynamic changes you may see will be a result of improved oxygenation where the patient should get better. Uh, VV ECMO, there also, you know, as, as a result of that, does not support perfusion. It supports it indirectly with oxygenation, but does not support it directly. Only variable affected is the CO2 and O2 content of the blood. And um, O2 delivery, therefore, or one of the issues, is dependent on an adequate cardiac output. Mm -hmm. So doing VV ECMO on a failing heart is fine if the failing heart is because of hypoxia. Right. But if the heart doesn't recover, you may be oxygenating the blood better, but it doesn't mean you're delivering the tissue, that big important DO2 number, mm -hmm. you're not delivering adequate tissue, uh, blood oxygen uh, to the tissue, perfusion to the tissue. So VV ECMO, uh, selection, ARDS, we're very familiar with that, severe pneumonia, severe hypoxemia, status asthmaticus, pulmonary contusion, airway obstruction, aspiration syndrome, smoke inhalation, how many aspiration pneumonias do we, have we put on ECMO a lot? Smoke inhalation, firefighters, things like that, or people, you know, that were in a house fire, uh, severe air leak syndrome, and uh, alveolar uh, uh, protonosis. It is, by and large, with some exceptions, a single cannula technique, which makes it a little easier. It can go in the neck, you can sit these people up, you can put them on rotoprone beds. There's a lot of things you can do because of the single cannula dual lumen technique. Um, you rely on the patient's own cardiac output for your pulsatilities. It's oxygenated blood directly to the lungs. So going to your point, John, you're helping the lungs, the lung tissue mm -hmm. heal 
because and this is something that is a is a benefit of ECMO that is often time not recognized or understood or thought of. And that is that when you have lung tissue that has been damaged and it is trying to heal, has ARDS, adding that oxygenation to the venous blood as it comes out of the RV, out to the pulmonary circulation, which is your primary right. Since we just learned lung that perfusion. From John. Right. Mm -hmm. Then having that pre-oxygenated is actually helpful to healing the lung. That and reducing your inspired FiO2 from the ventilator because that is corrosive. Right. And that's why you want high pulmonary, uh, you want the oxygenation, not just for just, it's for the, the total body, but it's very important for, for lung healing as well. And sometimes I don't think people really, re really consider that in their equation. Mm -hmm. And why I get a little bit, sometimes I get a little bit exercised when I feel like they're wanting to wean too soon, because I feel like I want that kind of like your, 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 your tissue, your heart, your lung, all your end organs. When you have a, an event happen, you've been hurt, mm -hmm. the more oxygen you can get to that tissue, it's just been proven over and over and over and over again. The, you know, that's how we heal. Yeah. You're getting what mm -hmm. it needs to the tissue. Perfusion matters. Um, we're essential, as a matter of fact, just so you know. Um, but you want that same thing for the lungs. And I, I, I really, I really uh, don't like it when, when, when sometimes you know, they get a little over aggressive in my view. I don't like to do that for that reason. Um, and you potentially get more oxygenated blood to the coronaries. Okay, potentially reminding you of that. Okay, so because sometimes you're on VA ECMO, you don't have a bad, uh, you don't have bad lungs at all. Mm -hmm. In which case, your lungs are going to do what you don't capture if you only need partial support. Like how many times we see we can't wean from bypass, you get down to a liter and a half, they still look good, but then you try to come off, you come off, and whamp, they, they, they crap out and you go back on and then you try it again and mm -hmm. you do this and that with the drips and you try it again. That patient doesn't need maximal support. And if they have good lungs and you keep them unloaded and keep their left-sided pressures also down so you don't back it up and get pulmonary edema, their lungs work fine. Mm -hmm. And that aortic oxygenation going to the coronaries and to the head is no problem. It's the patients who have no, their cardiac function is, is really bad. Um, unloading it makes it better, but you can only get to say the three liters and then they really don't do well. So you know they're not gonna come off pump, but their lungs are trashed and mm -hmm. your cannulated fem fem, not centrally cannulated, and their heart keeps beating and it's deoxygenated blood going out. That's when it becomes a problem. Yes. And you got it, that's why central cannulation, if for VA ECMO, post cardiotomy syndrome, central cannulation is really the way to go. Yeah, you absolutely. shouldn't convert them to fem fem. Absolutely. You know, and the hole's already there, mm -hmm. so why change it? Oh yeah. And just tunnel the cannulas, you can right. do that. Some disadvantages of VV ECMO, it's not protective during cardiac arrest, so now in the patient codes, you do have to run mm. in there and start pumping, okay? So now is the time to hit the alarm bells, drag the code card in there and start doing full, uh, full resuscitation. You have to do that. Um, it's more sensitive for volume management, so because you, are, you're basically zero balance, if the patient is fluid overloaded, there has to be some other way to get that fluid off. Of course, I'm a big CRT advocate. It does not rest the heart in any way, not the right side, not the left side at all. It's not an RVAD. That's a totally different uh, uh, animal altogether. And of course you have the big, one of the biggest problems is recirculation, mixing or having efficiency of oxygenation. And of course, I think I have, uh, let's see, let's see, where, where was I? What am I on here? You've gone back to contraindications. Mecha relative contraindications. Okay, so the relative contraindications, and I highlighted mechanical ventilation at high settings for e more or equal to or greater than seven days. The data is pretty clear that once you get to day seven, 
where you have maximum ventilatory support with high pressures, high PEEP, low oxygenation, your survival curve drops very quickly and very steeply. Um, obviously, these other things are also relevant, but that's one that didn't exist for VA. But these other things still do exist. If you're doing CPR, even if you think it's just a lung issue, you've been doing CPR for 45 minutes, you have to consider that patient. If they're immunocompromised, you have to consider it. If, they're have, if they have major coagulopathies, irreversible uh, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, and obviously advanced age. Um, and uh, what's absolute contraindications are non-recoverable heart functions exactly the same. I just won't even say it. The absolute contraindications for VV ECMO are the same as the absolute contraindications for VA ECMO. And this is really very simple. Is this patient survivable? A. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We can survive this patient with ECMO. Notice, can we keep them alive with ECMO? If the answer is no, don't do it. If the answer is yes, okay, that's a maybe. Is what's wrong with them in any way correctable? If the answer is no, yeah. You shouldn't put the patient on ECMO. Yeah. If the answer is yes, or I don't know, you put the patient on ECMO. Once the patient's on ECMO and you find out it is not a fixable problem, then now you're at the decision point right. and that's what bridge to decision actually means. Right. This, I use this graph all the time. Uh, if you just look on the left side, you have refract on the top left, refractory hypoxemia with a Murray score of three to four. You follow the, the arrows down. If you are or are not in cardiogenic shock, uh, or you, uh, and then depending on which those are, if you're in, if you are without shock or vasodilatory shock, like vasoplegia, then follow that line down and it goes straight to veno venous ECMO. Mm -hmm. If you are in cardiogenic shock, follow those lines down and you have to ask yourself two questions. It's one question with two possible answers. Is this due to hypoxemia or is this due to some other heart failure? Right. If it's due to hypoxemia, again, you go to VV. If it is due to another heart failure, you go to veno arterial or veno arterial venous, mm -hmm. which would be V dash AV, mm -hmm. okay, in this case. So with COVID, the world is coming to an end and we have finished the first part of my